Seen in Ottawa today as Canadians of all stripes pay tribute to the right honourable Brian Mulroney. Mulroney served as the country's 18th Prime Minister, known for leading the Progressive Conservative Party to the largest electoral victory in the country's history. Kim Campbell will go on to succeed Mulroney as Prime Minister, but first she served in Mulroney's cabinet, including as Minister of Justice and Minister of National Defence. Kim Campbell, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. I wonder if we could just start with what your reaction was when you heard the news that Brian Mulroney had passed away. Well, I was I was surprised um, and sad, and particularly when I read that he had gone to Florida to help recuperate from treatment for his heart and prostate cancer issues, and then has suffered a fall. And that just seemed to me kind of a, a cruel a cruel thing. That just when he was, should have been. Um, on the mend and uh, getting over some other illnesses that he would have this 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 bad ending. So I'm, I'm sad, but, um, you know, he's, he's had a remarkable and consequential life. So it's been interesting to see people taking stock of it and uh, I think giving it its due. He was a remarkable person and a remarkable prime minister. And I'm glad that he lived long enough for the time to pass for people to uh, do justice to his political legacy. Because when you do a lot of big things in government, um, people often, you know, you often make a lot of people mad. And it takes them a while to realize that maybe the things you did were important to do. Well, let's just talk a little bit about that. Because some of the things he did, he has this legacy of big swings with big hits on things like free trade, but also big swings with big misses for things like Meech and Charlottetown. So how do you think his legacy is going to be remembered? Because as you say, he was a prime minister who wanted to do big things. Well, I think his legacy is very strong. He didn't bat a thousand. He didn't get them all. But I don't think any of the things that he wanted to do were motivated by anything but a desire to make Canada better. There was nothing that he wanted to do in a mean-spirited way to uh, hurt anybody or anything. If, if, if anything, he had a vision for the country, and he was hoping uh, that he could help to uh, restore some sense of, of comity between English and French Canada and the Meech Lake Accord and then Charlottetown were ways of trying to do that. Now, they weren't successful, but I think they were well-motivated. Um, they were painful. But things like the free trade agreement, you know, as I've mentioned to, to some other people, what's interesting about Brian Mulroney was his willingness to rethink things and learn new things and change his mind. And like many people, um, he, you know, spent much of his early life thinking that free trade between Canada and the United States would be a non-starter because the U.S. was so much bigger and wouldn't we get rolled over? Although, in fact, free trade agreements between big and small countries often tend to benefit the small country more. But when the Macdonald Royal Commission reported out in, in uh, 1985, he saw their recommendation that we should perhaps take the leap of faith and enter into negotiations for a free trade agreement with the United States. He was prepared to take it seriously. He, you know, he, he didn't say, oh, no, that can't happen. And, you know, I think this. he said, you know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's more to this and maybe we should do it. And he did it. And I think that that was very admirable because I think it was important. And of course, it was divisive for the same reason that he was a knee jerk, you know, oh, couldn't happen. It would be a disaster until he was able to look into it in a more informed way. You talk about free trade and how divisive that election was and then how much that's changed, how much the country rallied to defend the free trade agreement when Donald Trump as president tried to tear it up and how Brian Mulroney was brought in to advise Prime Minister Trudeau on that. It just shows how much the assessment of his big swings changed over the years. And I think that has to be one of the things that was the great consolation, aside from his loving family and his wonderful kids, one of the great consolations of his post-political life was to see the value of things that he had done and fought for politically and taken, you know, been beaten up about and taken a lot of hits for, becoming established uh, lore in Canada and accepted uh, and, and admired. And, but I think it's a very good example of the fact that, that it's hard for governments to do tough things. And I think about, you know, where we're dealing with climate change. I mean, you're talking about something that keeps you awake at night. I mean, and Brian Mulroney had a, a, a very good record on environmental issues, one of the, the, the leaders in that area. But those are often very difficult issues to tackle. And yet, once they're done, you realize, you know, we had to do this. But there were a lot of things that um, 
that a combination of his skills, but I think also particularly his willingness to consider things that he hadn't always thought about. You know, he didn't come into office fully formed with an agenda of what he was going to do. There were priorities. He wanted to deal with the Quebec issue. Uh, but free trade wasn't part of that. He wanted to create a strong Canadian economy. But it wasn't until he was in office and the Macdonald Commission reported that he realized that this might be a piece of the puzzle that would help to secure you know, Canadian economic prosperity. So he was open-minded and respectful of good arguments, well uh, evidence-based uh, perspectives and, and, and uh, proposals that, that he could then uh, as the leader of a government, helped to bring into fruition. So it was quite um, delightful to to serve in his government because you you sat around a table with people who respected evidence, who uh, who wanted to do good things with the country, and we weren't we weren't blind to the political dangers of things. I remember at one meeting, one of my colleagues saying, with, with respect to the GST, you know, who is on our side on this issue? It was like, well, everybody's on our side on the issue except for that the, the, the business community wanted us to get the bill passed because they were already repricing their catalogs and needed it to come into force. But, you know, there's a lot of good things that you do where, you know, it's only after you take the heat and do it that everybody lines up and say, well, that was a good thing. And I'm, you know, I'm glad you did that. And, you know, I was always on side, you know, just quietly. Well, there's a lesson in there to be pragmatic and not be too ideological when you're in a position of leadership, right? Because circumstances will change, and if you don't change with them, you stop evolving, and the country stops moving forward. So, so I just wonder, Ms. Campbell, when you succeeded him as leader and as prime minister, did he give you any advice? Did he say anything to you about how to approach the job and give you pointers on, on what it would be like? Well, and generally not. More, more kind of the mechanical things of you know, you know, the residences and all of that kind of stuff. Um, no, he didn't. And, um, and, you know, I'm in a way I could have used some more pointers and help. Uh, but it was a very difficult time because he left office as the most unpopular prime minister in the history of Canadian polling. And, you know, the Bloc Québécois had, you know, run off with a lot of our Quebec vote with Lucien Bouchard. And I was glad to see that Lucien Bouchard says that they actually reconciled last week and had dinner together. And he was bemoaning the fact that so many years had been wasted. But that was a very painful, difficult time that not only did Brian Mulroney feel that his friendship had been betrayed, but that <laughs> that also Lucien had run off with a lot of our vote. You know, plus the fact of, of people in the West, you know, voting for uh, the Reform Party, which could never form a government. So it was it was a difficult time. And it was a hard, it, you know, the, the mathematical uh, voter calculus didn't didn't really uh, add up. But I think that what, but also he was he, he was very unpopular. And again, I think he understood that if I were to say, and this, he would always <clears throat> answer a question if I had one. <clears throat> Thank you, pardon. But. I think he also understood that it would not be a positive for me if people thought that I was just, you know, taking dictation from Brian Mulroney. I had to be my own person, but it would have been nice to have had more time <laughs> to be my own person. But, um, but I think later, as <clears throat> the years went by and people began to understand that he had a wealth of knowledge, they had a wealth of, of personal contacts uh, in the United States, but elsewhere around the world, and that he had... Um, a large reservoir of respect as a result of this positions he'd taken, for example, on uh, on apartheid, uh, that there were a lot of people around the world who respected him and that he could be helpful to other governments of Canada, irrespective of their partisanship, um, if they needed his help. And he was always willing to give it. And I think that's that's what we really mean by an elder statesman, somebody who moves beyond partisanship and takes the resources that they've gained and the knowledge that they've gained and tries to always be there uh, if needed. And, uh, and so I think he was. But um, it's, as I say, it's, it was a remarkable life. But there, you know, you can't sort of sum it up in 25 words or less. But I think that it's, I'm happy that, he, as I say, he lived long enough to see fairer considerations of what he had done. Brian can take great, uh, could take great pride in the enduring uh, legacy that he created uh, in Canada. And it was one that was designed to bring us together. It was not a legacy of division, um, even though some people disliked him and, and, and felt divided. But the fact is that that was never what he was about. 
and um, and so it's it's a, a historic time. And you know, I'm sorry he didn't get a few more years. I'm sorry that a fall has you know intervened into what I hoped would be a, a process of recuperation and maybe uh, some more opportunities to participate in uh, in the world that he loves so much. But um, but I think as as Canadians we should we should be pleased. And even you know I think of how unpopular Pierre Elliott Trudeau was when he left office. The same kind of you know people just hated him. I mean he was really just like. And then as the years went by and people began to realize, hmm, patriot in the conversation that was harder than it looked. And you know maybe that was a good thing. And you know there were a lot of things that that you know people said, hmm, you know this man really did make it make a, an important contribution. So. You know, you just have to live long enough and let, let the dust settle and let people see um, the consequences of, of your vision. And I think Brian had a vision. I think he led a very consequential life. And I'm just sorry that, um, that he didn't have more years to enjoy his, uh, his adorable grandchildren. Former Prime Minister Kim Campbell, thank you so much for speaking with me today. My Former Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole joins me now. Mr. O'Toole, it's good to see you again. Good to be with you, David. What was your reaction when you heard this news that Mr. Mulroney had passed away? Um, I was with my wife in the car when uh, a former member of my staff uh, texted and let us know. We were both just hit. We love, loved Brian. Um, both Brian and Mila were so wonderful to Rebecca and I. So even though we'd know, we knew Brian was having some health issues and uh, we knew he was getting close to the end of life, it was, uh, it was sad news because he was just... A force of nature. He was so lovely to us. That, so we share in the grief that, that millions of people are, are feeling now. He, uh, he spent time with you in the 2021 election campaign, and that was a rare thing to see with modern conservative party structure. Have Brian Mulroney out on the campaign trail. What did it mean to you to have him with you uh, in that election? Um, I have great memories of that day in, in Magog, Quebec. In fact, to sneak him in around <laughs> We had to walk behind in really uneven ground, and he wasn't as steady on his feet, but we kind of said, oh, we can do something. He said, no, no trouble, and, and he and Mal Mila were there. He was still great on the hustings uh, in his 80s, and for us, we were trying to target a few Quebec seats and remind them how well those parts of Quebec, particularly we were in the eastern townships, mm -hmm. uh, how well the country did economically because of Mr. Mulroney, and he swept Quebec. And, I wasn't expecting to sweep Quebec, David, but there were a few close races that we thought getting the support of Mr. Mulroney and, and talking about that. Um, I got a lot of advice from him on how important the French language and uh, culture and I Quebec identity was to the founding of the country and how to try and respect it as a leader. So it was a an amazing day to have him out and um, a, a real highlight. We didn't win the seat, but we drew an amazing candidate uh, in Vincent Duhamel to that day, and um, when Vincent heard that Brian was going to come and do an event for him, it was uh, it was an amazing day in the townships. Politics has changed so much in Canada since he had that big win in Quebec, right? Like we, the creation of the Bloc Québécois, and then the splintering of the party with reform and conservative, and then with the merger. I mean, what advice did he give you? Did, did you reach out to him and ask him when, when you won the leadership about how to approach a national campaign, how to be the leader of a party that, that encompasses so many different uh, competing interests, shall we say? I sought his advice. You know, I'd speak to Mr. Harper as well. Uh, I spoke to Mr. Clark. Uh, I would speak to probably Brian the most because he understood uh, growing up in Quebec as an Anglo but perfectly bilingual, working in the Quebec uh, uh, business community, ending the national energy program and ending the sort of the, the pain that Western Canada felt uh, in, the, in Pierre Trudeau's time, opening up Hibernia and really giving Newfoundland and Labrador the, the power to have some incredible growth. He, he always said to me, do what's best for the long term of Canada, uh, even if it means some unpopularity. For me, David, it was about vaccines and the pandemic. And I would say to him, I'm trying to put the country first. I'm trying to do this, but it's causing challenges. People are tired of the restrictions. They're, they're you know, really scared in some cases of a mandated vaccine. So we tried to approach that uh, reasonably. And he always said, you know, don't give up on people. Try and and, you know, convince them that your moves are the right ones for Canada. And so I tried uh, to, to emulate that, maybe not as successfully as he did, 
But um, I'll tell you, also when you were having a rough day or stress, there was always a bit of a, an Irish lilt and joke to, uh, to the conversations. You always left feeling higher after the engagement with Brian Mulroney. It's, it's something that's been consistent in all of the reaction is, is his personal connection, the way he knew how to make that one-on-one -on -one connection with people. And it's interesting you mentioned Hibernia. Like, I remember growing up, and as the fishery was shutting down in Newfoundland and Labrador, it was Hibernia, that industry, that him and John Crosby and others saved that, that kept the place going. I mean, that's one of his real legacies there. We talk about free trade, apartheid, acid rain. I mean, how do you assess Brian Mulroney's legacy as the 18th Prime Minister? I, I said last night um, in French, our position in the world has been in slow decline since Brian Mulroney. He, he was... He used that personal charm and that connection uh, with U.S. presidents, with Margaret Thatcher. And he did it, of course, for our economic well-being and for the environment with, with acid rain. But the Nelson Mandela and the end of apartheid um, should be a real big part of his legacy because he actually ran counter to the sort of head of the Commonwealth in Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. So he was willing to, to expend a little bit of that goodwill if it was for the right reasons. And... I don't think, you know, the first Gulf War, for example, David, Brian Mulroney's influence with President Bush, uh, Herb Walker Bush, was to be able to have that as a multilateral exercise after the invasion of mm -hmm. Kuwait. He was able to influence things in a way that I think was good for the world, and Canada hasn't had quite that clout since. The other thing I would say is he made the tough decisions. Hibernia, country was you know, high deficits at the time, interest rates. He was making investments that he knew would pay off in the long term for Newfoundland and Labradorians. But it was risky. But it was risky. The GST, a reform that is actually very smart taxation from a policy standpoint, but to introduce that in the midst of a recession, not easy to do. So some of the bold moves also hurt the popularity of the PCs at the time. But um, that was always his advice to me and to other people, and I'm sure to Prime Minister Trudeau, do what you think is in the best long-term interests of the country and be be prepared to take a few hits for it. And that's what I respect about him. No, there's certainly an assessment uh, that the historians will be kinder to him than the pollsters were, probably, when you look at how, how the political career ended. But, uh, you know, you talk about his charm and his ability to connect with, with world leaders. He also did that, you know, in terms of w with his opponents, like in the House of Commons, there was a connection there. And, and it seemed, as I, we were listening to people reminisce about it yesterday, that that's just not there in politics anymore. That, that sort of, you know, uh, the friendly competition has been replaced. I mean, how do you assess the political climate we're in now versus when, say, Mr. Mulroney was there and Ed Broadbent and John Turner, all of whom have just passed away in the last few years? Well, I think, I think that's a fair statement, David. I, I do think that um, some people say it was the advent of television. You know, I think that changed and created a bit more performance. Uh, I spoke a bit about social media in my yeah. final speech and how that's making longer term debates and committees and other things less relevant than just getting a clip. Um, I think over time that's eroding the ability to connect. Two things I'll also say though that I think makes Canada just fall into the rest of the democratic world is there was an isolation in the pandemic that uh, is gonna take 10 years to wind through yeah, our no societies. Way. And so what you're seeing in terms of some of the polarization here it's there in the United States. Uh, I work now for a European uh, company, and we see it in, in France. You see the farmer strikes in, in Europe. So I think some of this post-pandemic malaise is going to affect everyone. I, I think to, to follow Brian Mulroney's approach would be appeal to the better angels. Try and rise above it. And I encourage everyone still in Parliament to, to try and take that approach. And I tried to take that approach in the pandemic. And a lot of the guidance from Brian Mulroney was, was there to say, do what's best for the well-being of people. And I think um, when people get into politics, they, they get into it for that. They don't get into it to grow their Twitter followers. But I think as you get into this bubble, you sometimes, you know, and all sides can be a bit victim of this. So maybe people can reflect on Brian's amazing ability to, to, to connect with people on all sides uh, of the political divide. And put the country first. Aaron O'Toole, thank you for connecting with us today. That's former Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole.